Good morning. If you could break down world-class learning into its most basic ingredients, what do you think you'd find? Really, if, if, if you could just take the most basic solution and say, that is world-class, could you identify it if you saw it? Could you identify it if you heard it? You know, I've been struggling with some time around what is world-class and what is excellence. And frankly, it's just, it's challenged me through and through. Today, and that's really what today's about, is how can we start to identify, identify a world-class experience? I'm going to ask you to play along. I'm going to give you a working example of world-class. I'm going to use that today as kind of the, uh, as kind of the standard, um, and we'll integrate it throughout our story this morning. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to play a 30-second clip of music. And this music is brought to you by a world-renowned orchestra. And in those 30 seconds, my goal is that you'll build an image. This, this music that we'll play, it's only 30 seconds long, and it really is our best example of world-class in the autofill form. I want you to build an image of what that might look like in your head, a visual, okay? And let's go ahead and um, see if we can jump into that. Okay, so hopefully you have an image there, right? The conductor, the lines of chairs lined up in a perfect row. Maybe that stiff old guy that's been playing the oboe for 40 years, right? Wherever that might sit for you. But you have an image. I want you to hold on to that image as we go forward. The music I just played for you um, is the product of Gustavo Dudamel. Now, Gustavo Dudamel is a pupil of a gentleman by the name of Jose Antonio Abreu. And if you know Mr. Abreu, he is the founder and leader of El Sistema, which is the Venezuelan world-renowned orchestra. Now, what's kind of interesting about their music is as, to, as Mr. Abreu travels throughout the world, his orchestra and the audiences there regularly give him standing ovations. That's kind of the norm. But what's kind of interesting about Mr. Abreu is sometimes they play so well, they get a standing ovation that lasts 30 minutes long. 30 minutes. Can you imagine for a second just standing there for 30 minutes? Over, right, this is your ovation. I can't stand in one place for 30 minutes as a whole. But regularly, they receive standing ovations for 30 minutes. My challenge to you is think about your school or your classroom, maybe your teacher, maybe your own profession. What do you do in your line of work, or what do you do in your school that's worthy of a standing ovation for 30 minutes long? You see, when I look back at my childhood, I can find one, one example. And if we jumped into a time machine and went way back into my life as a kid, you'd find a classic case of at risk. I was abandoned by my mother when I was three. When I was six, my father uh, was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. In a few short years, he would jump into a nursing home. He wouldn't jump. That's not true. <laughs> he went into a nursing home. And I myself went into a foster home. In fact, I was in five homes over the next few years. By the time I got to about my 16th birthday, I was really kind of looking for that why in the road. And I found it. I, in fact, I bucked the system. And I swindled a deal with my casework at the time that allowed me to move out on my own when I was 16 and a junior in high school. Now. The real root of the story, though, is that school was my saving grace. When I look back, I had a guidance counselor late my senior year that actually cornered me and forced me into signing two things. One, a college application, and two, an application to the US Marine Corps. I thought I had school whipped, right? Of course, I was 17. I had that thing down. So I joined the US Marine Corps. And the day after I graduated, 
I jumped on a plane to San Diego, California and, and jumped into boot camp. But looking back, the courage that, that guidance counselor had in forcing me to sign an application changed my entire life. And for that, I owe her a standing ovation. Now, somewhere between that plane ride and my first days in teaching, I became obsessed with this idea around excellence and exceptional performance, whether it was in athletics, academics, or even just listening to an orchestra. And as, as I went on and I jumped into the classroom, gosh, I thought I was good. I was a great teacher, but the gravity of the system kept challenging me. You see, when I look back at my days in teaching, I was exceptional at handing out homework. I was really good. And I, nobody did a chapter review better than me, I promise you. <laughs> and I was a math teacher, so you know, I never let a piece of homework come, come through my desk that wasn't completed in pencil. So with all of those pieces, I was challenged every day with how can I make this experience even more? But I soon learned, and I'm learning even more today, that the challenges before us are nothing like teaching in the classroom and, and what I thought were um, uh, the big challenges of the day. We have looming challenges that are greater and beyond uh, anything we'd ever seen. I want to share three of those with you today. The first is the democratization of knowledge. See, Chris Anderson and the curator of TED, he introduced a concept just a few years ago called Crowd Accelerated Innovation. And he outlined that knowledge and skills and the ecosystem of knowledge and skills are rapidly advanced through web-based video. And when we think about web-based video, that's nothing more than exposure, right? And back in our time, the exposure was your classroom teacher or maybe a mentor. But today, the game has completely changed. 16 years ago, there were 45 million internet users. Today, that number is 2.7 billion. 2.7 billion, and we go, wow, big number, really big number. But that only represents 40% of our world population. So we have 60% to go. Those folks that can produce another level of exposure. See, exposure are the seeds to knowledge. And when we talk about web-based video being exposure, did you know on YouTube, YouTube has over 6 billion hours of video watched every month? 6 billion hours of video. That number blows my mind. Have you seen our generation when they jump onto YouTube? Right? My son, who is a high school now, he becomes obsessed with these two-minute, three-minute clips. I think that that exposure is unprecedented. And we still have 60% of the world population to give back. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two, I've titled, The Web Parents Are Coming. <laughs> the Web Parents Are Coming. You see, our current graduating class, actually, for a few classes now, all of those students were born at a time when the World Wide, world wide Web already existed when the internet was already there. My son, when he was just a few years ago, asked me, Dad, where did you buy books if there was no Amazon? <laughs> right? Their paradigm, their lens is so different than ours because they can't imagine a world without the web. Now, all of our students that are currently in our classrooms today, all of those students were entered, a, entered a classroom in the 21st century. So our notion of building 21st century classrooms is way too late. Those students are here. Now, the daunting part, let's take our current graduating class here in just a couple months, 2014. These students, uh, with four more years of education in college, it's conceivable to think that they're going to bring their, they're going to turn into parents and bring their own students to our classrooms in the next five to 10 years. And what would you think they'd expect to have? Are they going to be okay with 40 pound book bags? Are they going to be okay with the worksheet factory, right? Or my champion end of chapter review? I dare to say not. The last challenge is one that I think we cannot ignore because it means the fate for all of us. And that is that the school landscape no longer matches the work landscape. Companies like Microsoft, Facebook, and Groupon, these kind of companies are changing not only technically, not only physically where Collaboration and teamwork is the norm, but they're changing philosophically the way that you do work. Netflix, I don't know if you know this, Netflix no longer has a work hours policy. 
They don't have a vacation policy and they don't track sick hours. In fact, they've built a culture where the work produced is more important to them than the days worked. You can take as much vacation as you'd like. See, they're an outcomes-based company. And I think that means a lot for us. Rather than the process, they work on the outcomes. And I think that's a challenge that we need to address in education. Now I'll say that the conventional methods of teaching and the conventional methods around our schools are no match for these challenges. I know they're daunting. And in fact, it's going to take a contrarian approach. It's going to take a very large paradigm shift, something that's unprecedented, a proactive one, to start to address these changes. If you think about it, we are registering kindergartners today that will graduate in 2027. And that seems so far away, doesn't it? That's, we don't have to worry about them. With four years of college, that kindergarten class that registers today and will enter in the fall will enter our workforce in 2030 or somewhere around that time. Okay? What do they need to know in 2030 to make things work? What kind of skills must they have? And that is the responsibility of an education system. So what do we do about it? It's a contrarian approach. How do we change? How do we make radical changes to address these issues? Well, I'll share with you. We know from research that we cannot merely just patch a complex system. We can't just tinker with a system like that. We know that complex systems are derived invariably from simple systems that worked. So we must rebuild from a simple system. And I propose, what if we built from a system based on those three challenges that I brought up? What if we embraced global contributions? Can you imagine taking a math test where you could use any resource available at your fingertips? That's how we work today. Can you imagine shifting our schools to a time and location agnostic piece where you don't necessarily have to be at a certain place at a certain time to learn? That's how our workplaces are today. And what if we changed our measures so that they were true outcomes? Outcomes of authentic learning. I'll throw one at you and see, if, see how this fits. In a contrarian approach, what if we were to change the measures in our schools? Let's take a science department. And I don't really care about the standardized tests. I don't really care about the AP um, bio test that you're going to take towards the end of the spring either. What if we were to change that measure to measure the student's success at the International Science Fair? What if that was our measuring stick? Now I could start to say, well, come on, Ben. There's only a few select people that get to go to the International <coughs> Science Fair. Exactly. What if we were to raise the bar so high that that was our next step? As, as I start to describe an outcome such as that, such as the International Science Fair, or what if it was winning the Heisman Trophy, the Wendy's High School Heisman Trophy in athletics? What if it was the first robotics competition or a world debate team? If you were on the world stage, there's an example that something that is so audacious, something that's so far beyond. You know, Jim Collins said in Good to Great that to really make movement, you have to have a BHAG. You heard that term, the BHAG. It stands for a big, hairy, audacious goal. Something that seems so unattainable, something so far out there that it's almost not worth chasing. You know, Muhammad Ali also said, it's not the mountain before me to climb that bothers us. It's the pebble in our shoe. And anytime we bring up that large idea, it's that pebble of doubt that gets in our mind and we start thinking, I don't know if we could really do that. What if we're to measure our math departments based on the number of AP Siemens scholars? A national award, an international award, something that was so daunting. And this is where I want to make a connection for you. You see, let me go back to Mr. Abreu. Look at this. Um, Mr. Abreu himself had that same pebble of doubt. If we were to pull back the curtain and look at Mr. Abreu's story, it's actually fascinating. He had this gift of music that he was given, an absolute love for music. And he was pushed to be able to give that gift to his students as well. So he gets all this donated equipment, and he lines out his rehearsal stage, and he can't wait, and he invites everybody. And 11 kids show up. 
He has 11 kids. He's trying to build a world-renowned orchestra. And this is where the story really unfolds. I'm going to show you that the vision that you had around that orchestra was probably way off. That orchestra actually was a number of high school kids. These are high school kids. These are poor high school kids. And remember that we have the stigma that we have with poor kids. Poor kids can't learn. These are some of the poorest kids in Venezuela who are given donated equipment and are pushed to excel on a world stage. So he sets up his 11 kids, and he has a choice to make. And that choice, he says, I can even fold this thing up, or I can make a promise. And he did just that. He made a promise to those 11 kids that they would be the seeds to greatness, and that he would start an orchestra that would become a leading orchestra in the world, the same one now that gets 30-minute standing ovations. And I'd like to connect that visual for you real quick. We're going to look at these high school kids in action. How cool is that, right? You have a number of high school kids, and now he's affected over 300,000 kids in Venezuela and started to change the entire economy through his love of music and passing it on to these children. When I see the engagement in these kids' faces, and if you look up his story, these kids that will practice hours on end because it provides meaning for them, we start to really uncover the roots of world-class learning, where a promise, some vision, a little bit of work, and the engagement an absolute love for that science, and an outcome that's presented on the world-class stage takes us to a new height. So I ask you again, what measures are in place for you in your school or your classroom? And how far are we pushing them? See, everybody has a graduation rate. Everyone measures attendance, and sometimes we get all giddy about our advanced placement participation. But that's not an example of world-class learning. Everybody does that. Where do we push up and beyond? So towards the end, you know, Stephen Covey would say that these challenges are nothing more than stimulus, right? They're stimuli for us to make a movement, to do something a little bit different. Covey would also say that be, in all situations, you have stimulus and response. And our greatest power to choose, I already let out a bang, our greatest power is in between there, and that's our power to choose. See, Mr. Abreu made a choice, and we have that same choice. We can make change if we're only brave enough to take a contrarian approach to move us a little bit further. We can choose. What would your choice be? Thank you.